Welcome back to part two of Relational Database Design, Data Modeling for Beginners. Let's get right back into building an Entity Relationship Diagram, or ERD. An ERD serves as the blueprint of the entities, attributes, and relationships in your real-world scenario. Building an ERD forces us to figure out what tables, fields, and relationships we need in our database. Through the process of building an ERD, we do all the hard thinking, so when it is done, the database practically builds itself. Each entity becomes a table, and each attribute becomes a field. Which tool you use to build your ERD depends on what you have available. Working digitally gives you the flexibility to move things around and correct mistakes. Software programs like Microsoft Visio on the PC or OmniGraffle on the Mac are best suited to the task, but even PowerPoint, Keynote, or any software that provides a blank canvas, text, and line drawing tools can work. If you prefer to work analog, you can use pencil and paper, a whiteboard, or sticky notes on a large sheet of construction paper or cardboard. The only part missing from our classical music and kindergarten ERDs is the relationship lines. For that, we need to learn how to determine relationship cardinality or the type of relationship that exists between two entities. There are three types, one-to-one, one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. Many. Here is how to determine the relationship cardinality between entities X and Y. Ask yourself, for any one X, how many Ys could relate, one or many? For example, for any one record in the student table, how many records in the family table could relate? Well, only one. Now ask the question from the other side of the relationship. For any one record in the family table, how many records in the student table could relate? One or many? The answer is many, because one family may enroll many of their children in our school. So there's a one-to-many relationship between student and family. Let's do some more practice determining cardinality. Remember, we are asking, for any one of these, how many of those could relate? and vice versa. First up, customers and orders. For any one customer, how many orders could they place with us, one or many? Many, we hope, so we draw in a crow's feet symbol on the order side of the relationship. Now, from the other side, for any one order, how many customers placed that order, one or many? Only one, so we leave the straight line on the customer side. Next one, aquarium and fish. For any one aquarium, how many fish could live there? Many fish, so we draw the crow's feet. Then, from the other side, for any one fish, how many aquariums could it live in? Well, only one at a time, but it depends on whether we need to keep track of the history of every aquarium a fish has ever lived in, or if we only care about where they are right now. And this is why I limited the scope of our kindergarten database to only tracking which class a student is in right now, because it changes the answer to this question, which complicates things a bit more. Don't worry, we'll deal with that issue. But I did not want to drop it on you all at once. Back to the fish. Let's say we only care about which aquarium a fish lives in right now, in which case a fish can only live in one aquarium at a time. So we leave a straight line on the aquarium side. Next, movies and actors. For any one movie, how many actors could have played in it? One or many? Many, of course. And for any one actor, how many movies could they have played in? This time with no constraint, like at the current time. Over the course of their entire career, how many movies could any one actor play in? Many. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship. Many-to-many -many relationships are problematic, and we'll get into that next. But let's take a bit more practice determining cardinality. Students and classes. This time we're talking about older students. For any one student in high school or college, for example, how many classes could they have ever taken? One or many? Many. And for any one class, like Chemistry 101 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, how many students could be enrolled in that class? Many. So this is another many-to-many -many relationship. Last one. Artists and paintings. By now, I hope you are saying these three important words with me. For any one. 
because that's the context from which we determine cardinality. If you start with those three words, you'll always get it right. For any one artist, how many paintings could they have painted? Many. And for any one painting, how many artists painted it? Well, usually one, but what about collaborative efforts like a community mural? If the answer to this question could ever be many, even in rare circumstances, then you must assess it as a many. We see that many-to-many -many relationships are common in the real world. Now, let's discuss the problems with many-to-many -many relationships. Two problems caused by many-to-many -many relationships are that you cannot enter the data you will want, and you cannot produce the kinds of reports you will likely want to generate. In the actor and movie database, for example, if you have only these two tables, where would you enter the name of the character an actor played in a specific movie? There is no table for storing data that is specific to actor X playing in movie Y. The solution to resolving a many-to-many -many relationship is to insert a table between the two tables. This middle table is generically referred to as a join table, but finding a good name for the entity can be a challenge. An actor in a movie is playing a role, so we'll call this middle table role. It should have a primary key field, and we'll need two foreign key fields so it can relate to each of the two outer tables. In this case, actor ID and movie ID. This resolves the unhealthy many-to-many -many relationship into two healthy one-to-many relationships, and it is what you must do every time you discover a many-to-many -many relationship in your data model. I use some terms here that I want to define primary key field and foreign key field. A primary key field is the field we create in a table for the purpose of storing a unique identifier for each record or row. You should put one in every table you create. Some database development environments create a primary key field in every table automatically, for example Airtable and the last two versions of FileMaker. Others, like Microsoft Access, force you to create one but don't do it for you. And still others, like MySQL, neither create one for you nor force you to create one. The values in a primary key field should not have any human meaning in them. They should simply be auto-generated and guaranteed unique. We create foreign key fields in tables on the many side of our one-to-many relationships, as you've seen in all the examples so far, to relate to the primary key field value on the other side of the relationship. Let's see the role that primary and foreign key fields play in our original classical music database as we put the finishing touches on its entity relationship diagram. We know that a relationship exists in the real world between compositions and composers, yes? Composers write compositions. So we'll draw a line between the primary key and foreign key attributes in those two entities. What is the cardinality of this relationship? For any one classical music composition, how many composers could have written it? One or many? Only one. So we leave it as a straight line on the composer side. Then, for any one composer, how many compositions could they have written? One or many? Many. It is a healthy one-to-many relationship, so we add a crow's feet on the composition side. Next, there is a relationship between composer and era in that every composer lived during an era. So we'll draw a line between ID and era and era ID and composer. For any one composer, how many eras could they have been included in, one or many? Only one. So we leave it as a straight line on the era side. Then, for any one era, how many composers could have written during that era? One or many? Many. Another healthy one-to-many relationship. I hope you are noticing that most relationships are predicated on a primary key field on the one side and a foreign key field on the many side. Last one, between composition and style. For any one composition, how many styles could it be? One or many? Only one. So we leave a straight line on the style side. Then, for any one style, how many compositions could be of that style? One or many? Many. We add a crow's feet on the composition side and our entity relationship diagram 
is complete. It may help to clarify that the ERD is a blueprint or map of the tables and fields in your database, but it does not show any records of actual data. Here's an example of what our composer table might contain once you've built it and entered a few records of data. And likewise, your era table might look like this once built and populated with data. Now you know how to properly plan the structure of a relational database system. So make your plans and then go build your databases.